Good morning, and thanks for joining us this morning as we talk about the books that were left out of the New Testament, otherwise known as... Hey, does this smell bad? Ugh, it's spoiled. No, these yeah, are not good so books. <laughs> Don't drink it. <laughs> it's the Apocrypha. You're going to die. All right. So we're going to be talking about uh, the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, put some some words out there. We're also going to be opening this up to the live chat, which uh, will give you guys a chance to, to come in. And we'll put the link for that into uh, the live chat description here in a bit. But um, wanted to know for next week, we're going to dig into why books were chosen and why there were some that were left out. Well, we're going to talk about the ones that were left out this week to say, hey, what were these about? What were they? Were they in different categories? Why, why were they even partially considered? Was there some good stuff in here? So we're going to take a look at some of these and then get your input as well. Before we get started, please like and subscribe so we can get this ball rolling. Now, this really does help this channel to be able to get more people to see the material and uh, more discussions that come in on this. The uh, YouTube algorithm uh, picks up on that and says, hey, this looks like it's good material because people actually like it. That's cool. Definition. What is the Apocrypha? The Apocrypha is a term that means concealed or hidden. Uh, it was to cover the books that were looked at as being, they were good, but eventually they were not put into the New Testament. They were not uh, looked at as it being inspired. And uh, there is a specific group of books in the Old Testament Apocrypha that we'll be talking about. And then there's those that are set for the New Testament, which is a little bit more ambiguous. Now, the ones that are for the Old Testament are because they were actually put into uh, earlier forms of scripture, you see them in, um, they're in, in like the Catholic Bible. You do have some uh, Old Testament uh, books that were in there that were not in uh, either the Hebrew Bible or in the Protestant Bible. What we're going to talk entirely about the, the Old Testament on another series. This series is just for the New Testament. So, it included different writings on this, um, and I'm going to show a presentation that just just talk a little bit about the ones that are missing. Sometimes you hear these these terms like missing, hidden, uh, that they were they were not in the. It, it's it's almost like it's a conspiratorial thing where people talk about discovering these books. Oh, they were kicked out. They were banned. These were the banned books of the New Testament. The problem with that is it makes you think that, well, maybe there was something else that was better. Maybe something expanded on Christian theology that some old curmudgeons got together and decided that they weren't going to be including that because they didn't like it for a particular reason. But that wasn't the case at all. These were generally not accepted works and there were some that were just like not even popular at all they just weren't even they were just crazy they weren't even put in it and those are the ones that uh skeptics and those that would not would uh, try to attack christianity those are the books that are generally used for for the attack so we can kind of put these into two different categories there is the apocrypha and the pseudepigrapha and <laughs> Some of these names. I Well, hey, I think if nothing else, they're just fun to say. So the books listed as the New Testament Apocrypha were those held in high esteem by at least one of the church fathers. Although they contain helpful information concerning church, church history, they were never accepted into the New Testament canon. Some of these most popular writings uh, included... The Shepherd of Hermas, First Clement, the Didache, the Epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians, and the Seven Epistles of Ignatius and the Epistle of Pseudo Barnabas. Now, this is not a complete list. This is just a partial list. What is what was the Shepherd of Hermas about? 
Well, the Shepherd of Hermas was a book that was filled with visions and parables. It was popular in the early church, but not viewed as scripture. Uh, you can look at that like the purpose-driven life today. It might have been, you know, at least it's not po it's, it's popular as it was maybe 10 years ago. It would have been popular in the church. Now, you can imagine maybe 2,000 years from now, somebody doing some archaeological digging, and they find the purpose-driven life, and they think, ah, why was this banned from the Bible? Are they trying to hide something? Is there something that the 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 Christians are are trying to keep out of out of uh, the the true Word of God, trying to keep it out of Scripture? No, it was just around. It was something that was popular at the time. And then you can also look at the the Shepherd of Clement. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, First Clement. Now this was a letter written by the Church of Rome and sent to uh, the Church of Corinth. And what happened with the church in Corinth is they were, there was basically kind of a little bit of a rebellion with the younger uh, people in the church kicking out the elders. And it caused a, a lot of problems. And Clement, who was an overseer or a bishop in Rome, he sent a letter to them to say, hey, let's let's not do this. And it was it was good in that it shows church history at the time but it wasn't really considered scripture even in the early church but some of the some of the early church fathers do quote it then you have the didache now the didache was a book that was written very early on in about 100 AD so it was right after the this, the new testament books were written so you would have had maybe Revelation was written in 90 AD, and then you have the Didache that was written shortly after that. And it was a basically a list of how to live a Christian life. It was not uh, filled with theology much at all. It was uh, a listing of how to practice Christianity for early believers. Uh, for example, it was it talked about baptism in doing that in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is interesting because that means that 100 AD, we're already talking about the Trinity. Now, we have, there's enough information about the Trinity in the Bible itself, but often there are attacks about the Trinity itself. Well, you, you know, you, you, that was something that came much later in the church. It wasn't believed early on. This is... 10 years after Revelation was written, and we're guessing about some of these times, plus or minus a few years, but well within the early, early, early church, we're talking about the Trinity and baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus also talked about going and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit right. as well. So, right. Yeah, that's a bit yeah. of a this, this follows sticky wicket for those who try to claim that it's never in there. Jesus never talked about the Trinity. It's like, uh, no. He now, kind of made a commandment. Now, you might say, okay, modalism <clears throat> or different different ideas about how the, the Trinity is uh, functions and are the you know, three persons or the three different entities, that type of thing might be questioned here. But it does mention... These, these three names, at least, without going too deep into, into the doctrine of the Trinity. No one can test the authorship of the Didache. It, not, the scholars today, it's not like, oh, we're not really sure whether it, 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 it was written during this time. But these are different. These three that we talked about, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Fir, uh, First Clement, and the Didache, are, were popular during that time, and they didn't really challenge anything theological in the New Testament. Another one that we have was the epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians. It was another moral letter and not theological. It quotes the Gospels and Paul's epistles. If this epistle does not talk about the virgin birth, does that mean that it was not really believed in the early church? Nope. <laughs> so, yeah, that was kind of a strange reaction. No, it could be. It could be that it's just a known, commonly known thing. I mean, it might not. It 
might be so commonly known that you don't need to necessarily mention it. Yeah, and you can imagine that all the different epistles or writings that even Paul had, uh, or James, the, the book of James, it doesn't talk about a lot of things that are that brought forth in the, in the New Testament. It doesn't talk necessarily about the virgin birth itself. So does that mean that that was a contested item during the early church, or does that mean that it was um, not believed in the early church? And the answer would be no, that, that just because the absence of, any of this was done, but that was, that's the accusation that some critics would say about the new Testament. They would point to this and say, Oh, see, uh, we discovered some of these early documents and they don't talk about these topics. And therefore these topics were in question. And that's not necessarily true. So you also have a couple of others. I'm through. This is not a, 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 a long or exhaustive list at all, but there's the seven, Epistles of Ignatius and the Epistle of Pseudo Barnabas. Those are a couple of others. Again, these are were popular in the early church, but not necessarily accepted as scripture. Sort of like the purpose driven life. So I'm going to take a quick look at some of the comments. We're going to do the same thing that we did yesterday. Uh, invite you guys on uh, to do some live chat and. Let's see if we we'll can see how that goes. Yeah, see how that goes. With all the technical difficulties we've been having this morning, uh, not too sure how all this is going to work out. So we have Iskul. I actually read most of these in my reading of the early church fathers. Dude, you are a scholar. We need to. We're gonna. We're gonna have. If you, if you have the courage to come back up today, we would. We would much like. We're gonna have you as a guest speaker. Okay, we're gonna pop you up there. Um, and then I guess. I accidentally read some of the New Testament Apocrypha. What do you mean accidentally? Ah, just accidentally dabbled in it a little bit. Uh, Corinth, drunk. Um, you are a threatened sanity. You're in, you, you live in Greece. And so um, does, I'm wondering, probably not, to, not today. This is thousands of years later, but I'm curious to see. Does Corinth have a reputation anymore of, 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 being like, this is the, the church with all the problems. Uh, it seemed like in the New Testament that Paul addressed Corinth more than any other to for in terms of correction in any of the churches that he uh, wrote his letters to. So um, would you be able to get the... Okay, so as as we're put, we're going to put the link in the, the, the chat and the description. You can hit hide there. And this will allow you guys to be able to uh, join us in our discussions. We're going to do a live that we did this yesterday, and it was to, to good benefit. That was a, a really good way to do it. And we're going to talk specifically about the apoph Apocrypha, and then we're going to talk about the Pseudepigrapha, which is a – these were books that are just laughable, not even, oh, uh, not even where, considered. Yeah, yeah you know get some things from that, which is going to be interesting. Yeah, I don't even know if it's going to pull on the list. So, you know, you can mention some things about where the where, where the Quran is coming from on this. So, do we... That's on the issues here. Make sure we're good with the audio. We should be good then. Hopefully, we'll find out. Were we having some audio problems? Or we weren't playing anything back. Oh, so we'll find out. Well, okay. We don't have headphones. So and we'll make sure there's no echoing. Woohoo! Technical difficulties. Okay. So yeah, and if anybody wants to click that link, you should see it in the live chat uh, to join us and uh, we can go from there. So was you, up way too late with my wife last night doing a live stream with David Wood. Yeah, how did that go, by the way? It went very well, I thought. A little off topic a couple of times, but very good. I can't imagine Mr. Wood being off topic at all. Was it him or the uh, the chat it's that ended up Mostly being... my wife. She went off topic? That's pretty wild. Okay, so as uh, as we're waiting for someone to jump on the live stream and join us, and I need to get rid of uh, this comments. As we're waiting for someone to jump on the live stream, let's go ahead and look at we looked at the Apocrypha, and this is, not, like I said, this is not a full list. It's a partial list. There is also another group of books that we're 
like you said, not even consider. They they were false teachings and th- they were out there. And we have more than 200 of, in 280 of these. They include the infamous Gospel of Thomas. If oh, you've yeah. Ever heard of that one? Uh, by the way, there's only one copy of that around manuscript. And uh, compare that to all the thousands of manuscripts we have for the New Testament. And here's a question. Why is the Gospel of Thomas so popular in modern literature? Because it, it's the one they want to go to because it supports whatever ideals they're trying to push out. Yeah. A lot of times it supports some of the concepts in Islam. It supports some of the concepts. It counts on who you're talking to. Right. Because they'll snip and clip. Just like they'll go to uh, Bart Ehrman. Ah. for some of their definitely Muslims will run to Bart Ehrman for some of their stuff but then like whenever it comes to the uh, death of Jesus they're like nah he has no clue what he's talking about when he talks about that being a historical fact that's beyond question right <laughs> it's like no no but, he had no clue do you want to explain because I think that probably mo- most of the people in the chat know who Bart Ehrman is or maybe not and there's probably other people that are going to view that don't know who who, who is that Always one of the critics of Christianity. He, he claims to have once been Christian, and he now he's not. And he's written multiple books that are just laughable about apparent contradictions in the Bible. Which, again, if you understood the Bible at all, they're not at all. So, um, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and put up a couple of comments. This is follow up from. The earlier question about Corinth, uh, she says the entire uh, Corinthius area is covered with vineyards till nowadays. Wow, that's interesting. So it Um, used drunkards. Well, I don't know about that, but it used to be used to be a seat. Now, what's interesting about Corinth? A little side note on this, and talking about going off on a tangent. uh, Corinth was a Roman city. City. It wasn't something that would have been back in Alexander the Great's day, and the reason was is if you can imagine. I don't know if I'm going to do this right with my hands. You have um, Greece that comes down, and then you have this this little bit of land that connects to the larger. It's got the three fingers uh, peninsulas that come down here. But in that little spot in between, both uh, both sides of the sea come up to one point, and they cut through it with um, commerce. It wasn't really a canal like you have in uh, the Panama Canal where it narrows down between the two Americas enough that you can really create a canal and don't have to go all the way around. Well, this is the same concept. You don't have to go all the way around um, the peninsula because you can cut through on transportation. You unload boats on one one port, you move it across land, and you load boats on the other port. And I, I think the area where the peninsula was, it was treacherous water. So this really helped with commerce. And as a result, city grew up there practically overnight. And like a lot of frontier towns, a lot of commerce-based towns, there was, hey, we got wine here. Talk about vineyards. We got wine here. We got a bunch of other debauchery and things that we can sell you. Look over here, sailor. Look what I got for you. And so this kind of town grew up and you can imagine also a church that grows up in this town or is, is, is put in this town that it's going to have some problems. Yeah, a lot some, of issues. Right. And so now mostly a, a place, place of vineyard. That is, that is very interesting. Um, and then produces the best wines in Greece. Corinthians still celebrate their wine. <laughs> well, there you have it. You were correct about that. Um, and then we're talking about other great scholars of the time. Um, he is, uh, we'll, we'll bring him up right now. Daniel Brown. Is it St. Daniel Brown, by the way? I think it is, right? That uh, has has sure. all this knowledge. We'll go with St. Daniel Brown. Especially, uh, Why not? Yes. Especially about the Council of Nicaea. He was a great scholar about, we're being very sarcastic about that guy. knew practically nothing. And unfortunately, he was very popular. And with his popularity, he brought a lot of false ideas into history and about the about the early church. And we also have another great scholar here that is mentioned. Uh, sorry, did you mean Bart Simpson? Uh, was he a saint, the early church father? Maybe somebody can explain. It'd be equivalent I, in intelligence I, I, to these other two gentlemen. I don't recognize the name. <laughs> he must not have been very popular. 
So uh, I uh, we're we're hoping that um, one of you guys can pop up and give us some more information, not just put in the chat, but also physically hear your wonderful voices up here. So the Gospel of Thomas was one of them that would have been put into the pseudepigrapha. The others would have been the infancy Gospel of Thomas. And that one got, Muhammad got a hold of that one. Did he really? Oh, yes. Where Jesus is talking, making clay birds. Those are both in the Quran. Multiple locations, actually. Okay. In fact, where you see where it says that Mary is the sister of Aaron, brother uh, Aaron being the brother of Moses, by the way. And that is the mother of Jesus. You can see why these didn't even make the first cut. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm talking about the Quran part. Well, okay. That's yeah. not necessarily in the Apocrypha part. Right. That one. But then Jesus is in the crib and he's like, hey, I'm the messenger of Allah. I got this book for you guys. So it would it be proper to say that uh, the Quran would have been a pseudepigraphal book that never made the cut into the New Testament? It could have been on some of the, some of the lines there. I would say more of just a straight up cult. Right. You don't, I'm being somewhat facetious. I mean, 600 years later or so, it would not have have even been considered at all. But had it been written about around the time, let's say the second century, uh, it would have definitely fallen into the pseudepigrapha category. It would have been laughed out. It would yeah. have been actually worse than most of that, considering some of the things that are said in there is even worse than the worse of the apocrypha accounts. <laughs> considering it steals it from most of them. Do you have an example? Uh, what, just the infancy gospels there. You have another one where um, during the birth of Jesus by Mary, she's there underneath the palm tree, and she's strong enough to shake this palm tree, and dates fall down, fresh dates fall down, and there's a spring that jumps up, and it kind of sounds like Jesus is talking to her as he is being born. Saying, hey, you know, there's a spring down here. You know, eat the dates, drink the water, have a good time. And I'm like, what is this load of garbage? Yeah. Doesn't even so when you when you said is smell your coffee, is it is it is it good? And is it still good? Um this is it does that something like this just doesn't pass the smell test. Oh no. Then you got the uh provisions for Mary in the temple. That it comes out of one of the apocryphal accounts. I forget which the name is exactly, but it comes out of one of them. You have Jesus making clay birds. Oh, yes. And just speaking. Actually, that's twice in the Quran it refers to this, where he just speaks and is when he's a child and makes clay birds and they fly off. And it's like, why? There's no real reason why this miracle is needed. I think that's part of yeah. why it doesn't pass the smell test, because each of the miracles that Jesus did had a particular reason for it. It had a point. Like the feeding of 5,000 and, and, and others like that, where he had compassion on those who came out. They were hungry and he fed them and a man needed to be healed. So he healed him. Making clay birds and having them fly off it's almost like, well, did is he just goofing off, or did was the creation not complete that he had to come to Earth and kind of do it himself as a child? Or what's what's the deal with it? There's no reason given. There's also apocryphal accounts of um, Jesus when he was just bored and he's there with his, his some other kids. He turns the other kids into goats and have them dance around while he's playing the fiddle. I think, if memory serves. And then turns them back, and it's like, why? You're just you. It paints him as more as as a trickster than anything else, right? Like a little Loki. There's a couple character. other ones that just paint him as Loki, basically character. And it's like, why? And then you've got the axe of Paul, which takes some um, copy paste some stories straight out of Greek mythology with the uh, lion. And the thorn in the lion's paw. Mm. But instead of the paw, thorn, it's baptism. Oh, yes. And then later on, he's put in front of the lion in the Colosseum. And the lion's Christian, so he doesn't kill him. It's like... Ah! Yeah. 
<laughs> so no. I, I've heard, and I'm not sure if this is a true story or not, but I heard that one of the ways that um, we can test if dollar bills are a currency is real or not, is that you, you take, um, this is a government program, you take American people, dollars. American dollars, yes, take, take people into a room and you're going to train them. They're going to be uh, currency experts and see if these are real. Now, I think that this is an older way of doing it. You don't do this. You don't use this method anymore. I believe it's automated, but they would give people for two weeks real currency and they would just count them get their their whole for eight hours a day just count count through all the all this money to boom 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 and then after the two weeks not tell them slip some counterfeits in there and so they're just counting 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 and they come to one say that's not right yeah i feel right something's, something's, something's wrong right. with this one and that is how i believe that some of these earlier manuscripts some of these earlier works came up and uh you did have uh you 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 had these 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 scriptures these writings that came about and people just said that's it doesn't pass the smell test it just doesn't feel right it doesn't look right and the real scriptures rose in pos uh, popularity these others just kind of faded they never really uh, took hold, especially those in the, the pseudepigrapha. So we've got the Gospel of Thomas, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Another one would be the Gospel of Mary. And I don't know if this is one that the Quran pulls Probably. out of or not. <clears throat> no, that it took off multiple parts of Mary's life where she's given birth. And then again, when she is a young child and she's given miraculous provisions in the temple. From the hands of doves. Uh, Francis Boyle says, Cura. Corona poop. Oh, Corona poop makes chicken uh, cock a doodle do. Uh, yeah, it's it. Or not, not sure where. Obviously, it wasn't from God. The Quran was sourced from other material and. I, you know, how would it have been different if he if he had access to, to real scripture at the time? You know what's so bad about it? The, the people around him knew this. Knew it and called him out on it. Yeah. Said he's he's an ear. He just hears what he wants and then re copies, pastes it down and sells it as his own. He's, uh, you know, these are just the fables of old. Mm. And that's in the Quran. That's like, okay, they're call literally calling you out for these things because of this. Just like... Um, was it the romance of Alexander the Great is copy and paste of Dual Carnane? He just heard the romance that's popular in the time period, and that's completely fantasy, 100% fantasy. But he took that as absolute truth and put that into the Quran. As history. As history. As this is God's point of view. He's got, this is his stamp of approval. It's like, man, this is like, Taking Star Wars and saying, "Ah, oh, look, here you go. You got Star Wars stamp of approval." <laughs> not, not even close. Um, so we have also uh, Thomas Hall said, "Sounds like he was create recreating the creation accounts of Adam." And yeah, that's true. All right, so let's see here if we can get this to work for us. Okay, we'll try. We do not have our headphones on. We're hoping we're not going to get feedback on this. Good morning. How are you, Francis? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good afternoon for me, actually. No, <laughs> that's true. Uh, what are you uh, about five hours ahead of? What time is it for you right now? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, half just 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 gone past half half one. So yes, I am about five, five hours. hours. Five hours. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, do you would you what would you have to add to the discussion here? Um, in all honesty, um, first I've got I've got two things to say. First, you always say my name wrong, brother. It's Francis oh. Boyle. Boyle. Cool. Boyle. Like, where do you get the boil from? <laughs> Thank you. I was hoping you'd correct me on that because that was a wool. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. I'm, I'm just making a joke out of it as well. Don't take this as a serious. No, 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 no. I don't. I definitely don't want to get your name wrong. 
no, no, it's all right. If even if you get my name wrong, you know who I am, anyways. That's right. <laughs> right, but that, oh, one thing I would, I would I would like to add is because now within my limited understanding, in all honesty, I sometimes do wonder why these certain books did not make. Uh, make the whole canon of New Testament is because when I read uh, about St. Paul more and more of why he, because of all his wisdom and knowledge, he was sent all across to uh, the Gentiles because they were more educated and Paul had that sort of knowledge, even though he was a zealous Jew, but he also had a knowledge that he was more educated. So maybe they conferred everything with St. Paul's teachings and they saw the uh, other side of the books and they said this is not really making the call here this is not really actually uh resembling what saint paul would have taught uh in alongside with you know with for the gentiles so in that context in that limited understanding of mine i do say that maybe this is the reason that these books did not uh, make the catch and especially as for the other uh you know like the Gnostic Gospels, which is like Gospel of Thomas or Infancy Gospel of Thomas. I've heard about these, but as for Apocrypha itself, I think they didn't in, uh, they didn't really bring any sort of different uh, or something of which was necessary, or maybe they had some sort of a challenging ideas in there in regards to all the apostles themselves with their teachings and someone else just coming in, bringing their own gospel and teaching the same thing, but not in a sense which is necessary. What would you say on that? Well, okay, so you're, you're saying that, uh, first of all, it doesn't doesn't sound like Paul. It doesn't He doesn't, yes. uh, it doesn't have the same tenor. And then the second, it's not really bringing anything else to the table. Or in some of these cases, they were historically or, or, or fictional, uh, fictional characters and things were put in there. And they said, well, that's not even, not even accurate. So that would be put out. So there were... Um, we're going to be covering more of this next week, but there were there were some rules that were kind of used there in general to say whether something would be included or not. Uh, whether it was written by an apostle or ap somebody who's apostolic in ministry. So like the, the Gospels, we have Matthew and John. Those were two of the apostles that were with Jesus, right? Yes. Well, Luke and Mark were not. But they were companions of Paul, and Mark got his information from Peter, and Luke got his information mostly um, from Paul. So they were they were companions of the the apostles. So they were put in the same in the same category. Um, then you have spiritual content. Does the content of the book provide spiritual edification for the believer? And this was a practical uh, test for it. I think that's partly what you were just saying with the content is that correct yes yes brother okay so that was that was a consideration the other was uh, doctrinal soundness is the content of the book doctrinally sound does it is it, any book that contained teachings contrary to what was already accepted and they were already canonical books it would say well this isn't line up it's it's out so anything that contradicted and then usage, the fourth one would have been usage. There was the book universally recognized throughout the early church and widely quoted by the church fathers. So you would have, um, for example, Polycarp, you might quote uh, some or Ignatius, uh, quote scripture, and was this quoted by them? And that was put in there as well. And the, fine was, the last one would have been something was divine inspiration. Does it give true evidence for... Um, divine inspiration does it look like god wrote this uh this is kind of like a mysterious how do you really gauge that type of thing uh but this was the ultimate test so everything else comes together they're saying hey yeah this this looks like it is unique and special and it was inspired by god there are definitely ones that stories that were taken from cultures that were put into some of the apocryphal accounts that mm -hmm. you could see why they were thrown out because there were known stories they're like no this is this is just plagiarism, right? You're just taking stories that are well known, rebranding them and putting them in here, trying to pass them off as Christian when they're really not. And that was grounds for them to throw it out. The Acts of Paul is one of those examples, which, again, if we look at the Quran, then it kind of did the same thing. Yeah. So you have the Gospel of Peter. That would be another one. Uh, the Proto-Evangelion of James and the Gospel of Judas. Now, of all the 
<laughs> people may have the gospel of uh, the gospel of Judas would probably not have been my first okay. choice. Oh, Judas. Think, yeah, it does. There's two there's, Judases. Yeah, it was. It I would have changed my name. <laughs> I've been like, forget this. I'm changing my yeah. name now. I don't think there's a whole lot of babies that are named Judas right now. Yeah. Uh, when the when, well, another question, brothers. Uh, when the Bible talks itself in regards to um, follow the words and the word of mouth, the traditions of man, basically. So would they have also contemplated the fact that these traditions are not really matching these Gnostic Gospels as well? Do you think that would have been a case as well when you, when it comes to the realization of building up the canon of New Testament? Can you restate that? Uh, like using using the traditions uh, of the early churches, using the traditions of the, uh, uh, of the early, you know, like the early traditions when it talks about the Bible and follow the traditions, follow the word of uh, the word of mouth, basically, in regards to uh, building up as a Christian society and keeping the traditions uh, of people from the early churches. Do they think, uh, do, would they have seen that this is also going against uh, these Gnostic Gospels? And they would have said, yeah, this is something against, would they have contemplated something like that in their mind? To think that yeah, this is how we're going to build a new new canon of New Testament now, because some some of the things in these books are not really traditionally, you know, going with our sort of traditions. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. So uh, let me see if I can restate that to 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 make sure I understand what you're saying. So this would be the measure of doctrinal soundness. Was for example, you do have the Gnostics, and Gnostics heresy uh, started very early. In, in fact, uh, John, uh, the Apostle John, addressed it even in in his Gospel. You can hear some of the things he was saying that you know Jesus was physically there. And uh, just to to make sure we're clear on on the idea of Gnosticism, uh, first of all, it, Gnosticism comes from the Greek word Gnostic, Gnosis, to know, and. Uh, it was the idea that there was a secret knowledge. And there's a lot of religions that, a lot of these little religions that have popped up around the first century about secret knowledge. Oh, you have this knowledge, we'll give it to you. Like the, even in the, the Gospel of Thomas, um, Jesus had taken, in the, in the recording of the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus had kind of taken Thomas aside and told him three things that he was not to tell the other disciples. So it was sort of like that he had the secret knowledge that everybody's going to know. And this the, the Gospel of Thomas was a Gnostic text. The idea of Gnosticism is that everything physical is bad, everything spiritual is good. And it even questioned Jesus coming to earth physically, that he was just a spirit form. And he didn't obviously didn't die on the cross because he was not flesh. And so that's why John addresses, says, we, we were there, we can testify that we touched him, we felt we, we, were, we, ate, we were with him at the time physically. And so there's a lot of attestations to the fact that Jesus had physical form. He was he was fully human, uh, as, as well as being fully God at the time too. So that's why that's why you address. So there was, in terms of doctrinal soundness, there you can even see. I believe some of the early church fathers are also talking about these heresies and say this does not line up at all. The Gospel of Thomas was not even considered at all to be a part of Scripture. Does that kind of answer the question? Yes, but well, it does uh, because at the end of the day, there was uh, I, like I, like I'm I'm studying a lot deeper in regards to theology uh, when it comes to the early churches and then going the uh, ecumenical councils and non-ecumenical councils. I'm reading all I'm brushing up all on these sort of things, and when reading further and further, I'm finding I'm getting the realization like at the very start, at the very beginning, there were so many different ideas people were taking out uh, out of context, and they were like just preaching different different knowledge like Nestorianism, Arianism, predestinations and everything and I'm like wow at the very beginning this could happen and then we still are holding to the point where we are we still say okay we cannot uh, adhere to these ideas so it's quite it's quite it's quite a it's quite a miracle in a way I don't know how but we've still kept the early, early sort of ideas that no, we need to separate ourselves from these things, these people, and these things, these sort of extreme ideologies which are corrupting the basic role of Christianity or the or role of a Christian person. So, thank you so much for that, brother. Thank you for enlightening me in that. Part. <laughs> no, that's all, that's all good. Very good. Yeah. So well, uh, that was kind of the actual purpose of the Council of Nicaea. 
was yeah. to deal with some of these. A Arianism was a big thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deal with some of these. Just they're popping up all the time. Okay, we just this is it, guys. Stop it. <laughs> well, it, and I also heard the accusation to say, well, Christianity is is obviously bunk because you had all these disparaging views even early on. And I would look at that and say, if anything, it attests the opposite because. First of all, the enemy is going to want to come in and poison the 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 soup as soon as possible. Yes. And if you have something that's authentic, you're going to have to want you you will have people that will either want to copy and make it their own, or uh, want to corrupt it. So the very fact that you have a lot of these heresies early on shows that shows the validity of Christianity, not the opposite. Amen. Absolutely. So. Really guys, yeah. I'll let someone else come on. So thank you okay. so much. Like thank you. Problem. And thank you, brother. Love and I'll try to get your name you. correct in the future. Uh, there's no why in my name, Boyle, Boyle. I'm like egg boil. Fair enough. <laughs> 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 Fair enough. God bless, brothers. Have a good day. You thank too, thank you. The back. Thank you. So I'm going to take a look at some of the other uh live chats that are here. Um so uh davos has joined uh, davos davos i should say is cool uh he has i'm just going to throw a couple of these up it was good to hear your thoughts yesterday yeah that was uh when when he had come up and threatened sanity exactly it's the bible we know about literally spiritually versus uh physiological so uh, I think that we kind of covered the general output of, or the, the general view of these two different types of categories. We have the apocrypha on one side, we have the pseudepigrapha on the other, and these are not hard and fast. There's not really a strict division line between these two groupings. You have the first group that they were popular books, but not viewed as being scripture, and then you had the, the, the way far out there books the pseudepigrapha. And of course, with skeptics today, those are the ones that they'll want to choose because they'll show contradictory theology uh, to to what is really scripture and so forth. So oh, yeah, if, if you want to attack Christianity, these are the books you're going to come out and say, ha ha, look, these were the ones that were stolen. These were the ones that were hidden from you. They were banned. They were pushed aside, but we discovered them and they're the real Christianity that the the organized christianity wanted to to cover up and that well, was we did a very bad job on covering it up yeah <laughs> considering we can find it yeah pretty easily that's true so uh there is a lot of that going on so would you uh is there any other comments that you wanted to or any other things that you wanted to add oh, to this no, not too much i think we've hit everything on it another part of the quran that pulls it up is the seven sleepers i forget which apocrypha account that was from but again it's just copy and pasted from the apocrypha. Account. What's what's the account of the seven sleepers? Oh, uh, where the seven sleepers, it's that these seven went to sleep, woke up, you know, hundreds years later, and then I forget what the actual account is. They came out of the cave and went from there, but that comes straight out again, straight out of the apocrypha account, and it's like you just copied and pasted this. Uh, another thing that definitely Islam takes is not necessarily from the Apocrypha, but it's from uh, the monks of the age around where the uh, five daily prayers and even the times that those five daily prayers are it lines up with their prayers. And it's like uh, these monks were doing it for hundred plus years before Muhammad came around. Right. It's like, This looks like you just copied and pasted that too, and that's one of the pillars of Islam. This is right. a little important. Now you're taking the pillars, just copy and paste it from from other sources. You're uh, talking about like they had the canonical hours, vespers, and it, it would have been an evening, and so forth. These different types of these different different ty types. types of prayers are actually listed out, and you can even look at them. They have the this time they got up and prayed at this point, and then they went and did their work, and then. They stopped and prayed at this point. They went and did their work, and they stopped and prayed at this point. It's like, that's Islam. Yes. Yeah. And they even mark the times of days based on 
these different prayer names and they were called canonical hours. So yeah, that was a, that was a a point of Christianity, not necessarily Islam that, that it assumed. Um, so I'm looking at some other comments and, and making sure that we have any. I think we pretty much covered this. We're prepped for uh, next week, which is is going to be. Oh, that's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be fun. There's there's something special some that we have planned with this. To join us, it should be a lot of. Yeah, lot yeah. Of good we're fun. we're preparing for this, and this is <laughs> going to be. I'll give you a little bit of hints. The the Council of Absurdia is getting ready to gather, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be a fun experience. So also next week. Next, we are going to review a movie that is a little more obscure, but I think it's worth taking a look at. And this is The Most Reluctant Converts. Ah. C.S. Lewis. About his experience, his conversion to Christianity. What was behind it? Why was why was he reluctant? And I would suggest this. It's, it, it's a biography. It wasn't something that was really big in the theaters at all, but... It's really good. If you get a chance to get a copy of it, uh, we're going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to go for a DVD version of this. I have it on order, bring it in. But I think it's going to be really good. We talked about C.S. Lewis and uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. He's in this as well. And wrapping those up to see what was it behind these guys? How, how was Tolkien an influence on Lewis's conversion? What was it that made C.S. Lewis tip over to become a Christian. It was a, it was a progress between just being atheist to agnostic to becoming a Christian. And do any of those arguments still have a uh, pull for us today? Would they make a difference in, in our lives? So that's going to be a fun one to take a look at to see if there's anything on there. So any last minute comments here? Uh, Dun, dun, dun. I think I think we have this one here. I'm reading it to make sure it's. I'm, I'm going to put it up, and then we'll take a look at it together. Islam claims this is Isaac Vanderwalt. Islam Islam claims that the Bible is corrupt. If they say it appears in the apocrypha, why don't they cite it as original? Uh, yeah, they don't claim that it appears in the apocrypha. It just does. It's supposed to be the Quran is supposed to be just. It's own unique. It's supposed to be from Allah by himself. No one else can do what Allah has done here in the Quran. It is something completely just different new and yeah. different in every way, shape, or form. All these revelations are new. They're not taken from other sources. But then you look at these other sources, it's like, eh, no. No, it's not. Definitely if you read the uh, romance of um, Alexander the Great. That one's almost, there are sections in that that are almost word for word. And it's like, ah, you're definitely, <laughs> this is called plagiarism here. You're, you're just you're taking it. it. <laughs> you're stealing it here. Right, right. Okay, so I think that wraps it up for us today. Thank you for the input. Thank you, Francis, for coming on. That was uh, a good insights that you had. And we'll see you next week for C.S. Lewis and deeper into the Council of Absurdia.